first, just to provide context for anybody listening, anyone watching, um, for how we know each other in the first place. You were one of my professors when I was here at the Hebrew University. I took a solid state chemistry course with you, and we chatted over coffee a few times. I really enjoyed those conversations. So naturally doing this podcast, it was uh, clear that I would like to do one of these again, turn on the camera, and here we are. So again, it's Thursday, end of the week in Israel, so I appreciate you taking the time. It's uh, probably not the most convenient <laughs> middle oh, of the day at the end of the week. Convenient. Okay, I good. Finish this semester. Okay, so. perfect, perfect. And uh, we'll talk for about an hour if that sounds good to you, or again, whatever feels natural. Um, so I'd like to start at the beginning. Um, obviously, I'm familiar. I went through your websites, and I know from our previous conversations a little about your background. But I think one of the most interesting things for any scientist or engineer is to learn a little bit more about how did you get started on a fundamental level, because every everyone has that whether they're out of nature a lot as a kid and they got curiosity from one thing or another, or it was just something sort of innate from the beginning. What, what was the draw to science at the outset? Hmm. Yes, interesting. So, so I was thinking about this question myself, and I also asked many people, friends, colleagues, that, that are in, in any way in science, uh, how did, why did you decide to study? physics, chemistry. Uh, so first of all, I can give you my statistics. Almost without exception, there are two answers, sometimes one of them, sometimes together. First, I, have a, I had a great science teacher, a great physics teacher, a great chemistry teacher. Second, one of my parents is in science, um, uh, encouraged me to uh, uh, to yeah, to to learn to learn something, and uh, these are the two sometimes together. Yeah. Both my father is a physics teacher. Who, yeah, or, that'll do it. <laughs> yeah, um, and for me it was it was similar. Um, so what happened was that by the end of the ninth grade. So, uh, so I was 14, see, yes, yeah, um, by the e end of the ninth grade, in the summer we, we visited uh, our grandparents back in Ukraine, so my family and I, I came to Israel in 1993, I was 10 years old, and uh, the grandparents still lived, uh, lived in Ukraine, uh, and we, we came for a summer vacation. Now, in terms of school, I did quite well, and I was good in math and in, in science and in whatever. So, so, but there was no clear understanding for me, at least, to what I want to do. And uh, uh, so, by the end of the ninth grade, so I finished junior high school. I went to high school, and at high school, you, at some point, you, you should start uh, making decisions on what your majors are and so on. And, but, but after the ninth grade, it was just the summer vacation. And my father, who is a physicist himself, an experimental physicist, um, he kind of made, he made a move, a small move. We met accidentally just on the main street of, of, of the town where we lived, so the, the, the town or city of Ushgorod, so Western Ukraine today, um, a, a, a person uh, who, was, who was a friend of the family, but also he, uh, in the past, prepared my father uh, for the exams to the university back in the 70s. But he was a friend of the family. I knew him uh, uh, since I was a small kid. And he was a physics teacher at school. If we stayed there, he would be my physics teacher, but this didn't happen. Uh, and my dad kind of, uh, uh, at the, on the spot, asked him whether he would be willing to give me a few physics lessons while on vacation. Mm -hmm. right? that's, that's a very kind of uh, uh, attitude uh, that is uh, attributed to... to Russian or Russian-speaking families that summer vacation don't, don't waste time. We do something <laughs> useful. We go and and uh, and he said yes, and that's how it was. So one day I had 
a lesson, one day not, one day I had a lesson, one day not, for, I would say, a month. And we went through uh, much material in physics. And so it was uh, classical mechanics. Mm -hmm. So some math I didn't know. So my grandmother, who was a math teacher, she, she told me, no, we, we'll go quickly through it. So there is some trigonometry. And this, and this maybe you don't remember, you don't know. We do it quickly and for you to be prepared for this yes. thing that, um, that was initiated. Again, it was supposed to be a summer vacation. Never um, by the end of this month, I think, maybe three weeks or so, we went through some, uh, I think, introductory chapters in, in classical mechanics. It was extremely difficult for me, unbelievably difficult. And my conclusion from this experience was that I will never ever uh, 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 studied it. Um, but I kept the notebooks. So we had kind of two notebooks with theory and with, with, with exercises. So I kept it. And I brought it back to Israel. And I went to high school. And, and here, is, here is a useful point. Um, I was curious about one problem. I think it, uh, there was almost no problem that I succeeded to solve out of all these mechanics problems that I, that I was given by this teacher. His name was Vasily Ivanovich Kuzma. Um, there was one problem that, that, that I was curious about. I couldn't solve it, but I was surprised by, by the solution. And I, I said to myself after a few months, no, just this thing, I, I need to, 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 to clarify to myself what's going on there. And I opened the notebooks again. And I solved it again. And I clarified it to myself. And it was satisfying. And it said, you know, the notebooks are already open. So, so you look also on other things. In parallel, I had an ex exceptionally good teacher at high school. His name was uh, Michael Gotz. Both this, this person uh, 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 died already a while ago. Um, he was an exceptional high school teacher. And by the end of high school, so uh, uh, he was our teacher for the 10th and 11th and 12th grade, I majored in physics and it was clear to me that I'm going to study physics at the university, which is what I did. Mm. So that's how it started. A parent who played, who played a, a crucial role and played it correctly, um, and a good teacher at high school. So, well, many things in regard to that. The first is it seems it's funny how many times you hear specifically a, a classical mechanics problem seems to be. I mean, even there's the famous story of Feynman at Cornell, and you know he, he explains it as totally losing interest in physics and not really knowing what it's to do and seeing a student spin a plate at the tip of his finger and just being transfixed by this problem and spending weeks and weeks and weeks eventually solving it and then coming to the conclusion of I'm only going to pursue what I'm deeply interested in. But it does seem like those... Because I guess the big picture of... of I'm not sure what the particular problem you were looking at are, is simple in the grand scheme of things, but they're captivating. They're absolutely captivating. And uh, it also sounds like it was a bit of exposure therapy, sort of. Like you just needed to be have enough time of people putting it in your face and saying, learn physics, learn math, until you finally find that one subset of the discipline that is engaging enough for you on your own right to go, this is it. The curiosity. So that's, that, that's key, to be curious. I encourage people to be curious in, in, in various directions. Uh, not to be curious about the gossip of your name, but to be <laughs> curious about so, 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 something important. Um, curiosity is the driving force. And I, I try to pass it to my students, both uh, those who take courses with me or, or, or those who, who work with me as part of, of our research group. If you have a question, don't, don't, uh, or, or, or you have an interesting idea, don't lose it. Write it down. Have a notebook, write it down. You don't have time to deal with it now. You don't have maybe the knowledge to deal with it now. You, you have another very interesting idea doing it. Never mind. So don't lose it. There is something you are curious about. Write it down. Right. 
open the folder on your computer, put, put things there. Then maybe after a month or a year or ten years, you know, get back to it, but then you have also experience and so on. So curiosity is, is amazing. And then with, with your father's background in experimental physics, how did you go and, uh, as you said, you sort of got captivated by the more, like, tangible, pragmatic sort of thing, side of things. How did you get into theory and computation, and how did your actual research interest today evolve? So, first of all, it is, I think, uh, quite a rule that if one of the parents, so the previous generation in physics, if, if uh, let's say, the parent is an experimentalist, so <laughs> yeah. the kid is going to be a theorist and vi- vice versa. So, one idea is... Uh, uh, Especially, so my father is not in academia. He is, he's, he works at a high tech company. Mm-hmm. He, that's what he did uh, for his whole life. Uh, but if, let's say, a parent is a professor at university, then surely you want to find your own sure. niche, right? And then you are saying, okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm addicted to this thing. It's called, let's say, physics. But, but I will be a theorist or. or by the time I finished high school, I was 100% sure that I'm going to be an experimentalist. Mm. I was really good uh, with, with, with lab, with, with, with experiments. I even... Uh, like, hardcore nerd. I, I, I was arriving at school earlier, and, and the, the person I- I in charge of the lab, she knew me, and she was giving me the key, and I could do whatever I want, and I... Uh, I used, I used some free time uh, just to do again the experiments we did uh, to, 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 to gain some perfection in it. To do it really, I had more time, to do it calmly, uh, uh, to really measure everything correctly, to, to, to bring it really to perfection. Yeah. One thing we were not taught at high school is that uh, uh, every experimental quantity, every measurable quantity has an error. So I wanted it to coincide exactly with theory because I didn't know it within some area. Yeah. So, uh, I, uh, but it, um, it teaches you some, gives you some experience that it drives you to perfection. Um, then there was kind of a set development. So at the first year at university, uh, also second year, Suddenly, I was first of all deprived from this option to do experiments again and again. Mm-hmm. Not only because no, 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 no lab administrator will, will let you <laughs> let you in <laughs> to, to the university lab, uh, and also we didn't have time. The, 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 the program was so intensive mm-hmm. that we didn't have time uh, to devote to devote it to, to, to lab. That's first. And second, I have to say, sadly, that the quality of equipment that was back then in the university lab was lower than that that we have at high school. Really? So it was, it was a way down. Yeah. Um, it emphasized something to me that as an experimental scientist, you are very much dependent on equipment, and equipment requires funding, and you, are, you, you, you depend on and, and if it is located... At some point on the globe, then you have usually to be uh, there. Mm. Uh, while as a theorist, you, know, <laughs> you have a notebook, you can have two notebooks, <laughs> you can have one pen, you have two pen. You, okay, so so sometimes you need a computer, but but no, nowadays you can access your 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 uh, cluster from mm. wherever in the world. Um, and uh, I could see this flexibility um, during. The summer after my second undergraduate year, I uh, joined uh, the group of uh, Professor Viktor Florov uh, in Tel Aviv University to do some um, theoretical work. Um, okay, so it was in quantum physics, maybe some yeah some solid state, um, and. By the end of that summer, I understood that I like it. I like theory, and uh, I guessed that I can be good at it. And th- this was this. Uh, this began, was yeah. a switch. Yeah, there was a switch. 
So I plan to be an experimentalist, but, but by, by, by finishing my, my bachelor degree, I already understood that probably I'm going to be a theorist. By the way, the computational part of all that, again, we had a course in computational physics, and it was very intense. It was manageable for people who came with, with background in programming, but not for me, I didn't have any background in programming. It was very intense, and I think it is one of my lowest grades in my un un undergraduate studies. Uh, and by the end of this course, I said to myself, never again, no computational, nothing. Uh, ended up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it seems like you should just so, expect that you converge on the opposite. Yeah. <laughs> by now, I, I already adopt this rule that yeah. if, I, if I feel that, that something is not going to happen or I just, just will not proceed in this direction, then okay. probably, probably it, will, it will happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's see. Do you, do you identify an advantage in yourself with respect to your colleagues or collaborators on the basis of having had some meaningful experimental work? Because I imagine for people who are started in theory and ended in theory, they might be sort of divorced from reality to the extent that it might be a hindrance in some regard. I mean, it depends on the project and so on, but... Um, so I did not... Right, I did not do any, any of my degrees in, in, in any experimental discipline. Mm -hmm. So so starting from my, my bachelor project, uh, everything was theory and computation. But I think generally people who aim at theory should at the ver should have some experimental experience at the very least take all the experimental courses, yes. all the labs that you are offered. There are different reasons for this. First of all even as a theorist, you you will derive something, or you will make a calculation, and you will compare it to experiment. We are, after all, in natural sciences, as opposed to math. So mathematics is a different, right? But we are in natural sciences, and you need to compare it to experiment. There are several things that is good to know. For example, experiments have errors. Uh, and when you compare theory to experiment, right, it's very useful, for example, to know that uh, it is not just a gold standard, it is a collection of various methods, various steps, various decisions the experimentalists made there, and they see something, they interpret it in a certain manner. And now there is a different piece of work, which is theoretical or computational, and here also. We made certain decisions, certain approximations, um, certain simplifications, and then we arrive at something. But, but to bridge this, to, are we looking at the same quantity? Did we make the same type of approximations? Is there any contradiction between these things? To, so to be able at least to, to communicate experimentalists, it's very important to, to have some experimental background. Also reading an experimental article. Having some yeah. background, something that's going on, it's very useful because you can see both the strengths and the flaws, right, of, of, uh, of the work uh, you're exposed to. Uh, and that's, that's crucial in, in, in comparing also theoretical work and to experiment. And, uh, and of course, this, this tendency to detach from reality that, um, that can happen to, uh, to theoretical people. Uh, Connection to experiment usually solves it. Sure. Yeah. One, one question that emerges from this for me that I think would be interesting to most people is when people hear theoretical physicists, computational chemists, and so on, I think there's very little sense of what that actually looks like in practice. You come to the office, you sit down, I think they have the, the mad scientist idea of scribbling on the chalkboard and the whiteboard endlessly. So could you describe a little bit about what it actually looks like on that level, to be in theory and computation. Yes. Um, so, isolating from my schedule the um, that that part of day that I'm doing science. Um, well, it depends. Of course, sometimes it's it's reading the literature and analyzing work of someone. 
sometimes it's it's intensively writing on the board mm-hmm. or, or, or 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 on paper or uh, uh, or on the computer and and deriving some equations uh, sometimes it is uh, writing a short program yourself mm-hmm. or contrib- contributing to another existing program um, but all of this and and of course much of the time is communicating to colleagues with colleagues brainstorming analyzing different ideas studying maybe some pieces that you are not strong in and you need them now but all this does not does not capture the magic of it because the magic is that sometimes during your day you go to drink a coffee or tea, or you have a, 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 your lunch, or you are walking home, or or you, you you put your baby to sleep, and in parallel, the brain is working. Okay. And at some point, you say to yourself, "No, but this this thing that I just just." know very well or uh, just studied deeply and I'm really on top of it and this other piece of information something doesn't match something doesn't work here or okay I studied something but it's very similar to something else right and then then you have this idea right Um, again while on the bus or or walking and so on so therefore if you see and and, uh, here I also address the general audience, if you see, especially uh, uh, on, on campus or around, people that, that uh, uh, suddenly stop in the middle of, 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 you know, of a crowd walking or sometimes start you know, hand-waving in a certain manner or, or, or they s- it seems that they, they do not fit into reality, don't bother them. They are busy. It is their job. It, 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 these are these 60 seconds that uh, something very important may come out of it. It looks weird. It looks maybe sometimes socially inappropriate. Um, let's pay this price. Sometimes it's good. <laughs> sometimes it's nothing. Yeah. Okay. But sometimes it's, that's the magic. And this magic, it's difficult to describe. But there is some switch in your brain that happens momentarily. And you need to capture it. So you need to be prepared for this. If you have an interesting idea, write it down. Otherwise, it will go away. Um, yes, that's, that's something. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't it, isn't <laughs> and then, then after you have this idea, there is a long, sometimes long, long, long work into formally writing it mathematically, checking it again, developing it, trying to... Uh, uh, deduce all the you make all the conclusions you can make comparing it to work of others again writing the relevant software and trying it out and applying it to let's say certain material and so on so from this spark there is sometimes a very long way to let's say published article mm-hmm. something usually many times how uh, our work is, is, is measured and also how our work is, is brought to the general public. Magic seems like the right way to call it because it, it's so counterintuitive because, you know, as you said, you spend countless hours explicitly dedicated to thinking about an idea and so on, and you may not make progress. And then you have that moment of serendipity doing the most mundane, passive activity. It's bizarre. It really it is. is bizarre. One, one, one question I'm really interested in I'm not investigating it actively, but I'm interested in is how do ideas appear? I mean, a moment ago, I didn't know anything about it. I didn't have this yeah. connection. I didn't have this idea. Now I have it. Right? Yeah. I have it. I wrote it down. Right? That's, that's the rule. Uh, how can we enhance this process, can we enhance this process? I'm not sure, I don't know. Uh, one thing I know that one has to be prepared for this. So one type of preparation is uh, uh, 
proper fundamental uh, education. So, so you ha should have the knowledge, right? Otherwise, this right. idea may appear, but but you, you may not be able to to embrace it. Uh, the other thing is being aware of it, and as I said before, capture it, take it, don't don't let it go and say, okay, I will think about it again. No, no. Uh, so so th these are at least at least these two. Uh, two rules that I have, and also, maybe a third thing, uh, you need to rest. You need to let yourself do something else, something unrelated, but, but then it seems that the brain is working anyhow, and if you don't have the stress to deliver it now, it's a little bit like art, it's a little bit like, like anything that it is kind of, you know, creative activity. If you don't have to deliver it now, then you relax and then it appears. Yeah. Or not. So <laughs> sometimes yeah, not. Yeah, sure. Many times not. But you have to relax. You have to do something else. Actively thinking about it, yeah, you can do it for some short time period today. And then I'm not sure that it necessarily brings the result. The active thinking or actively working about it is after you have some idea you develop it. You write the mathematical formula, so you write the equations. You do it correctly and precisely. You check yourself. You 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 don't understand something, so you you let's say you solve a simple example, then you kind of teach yourself. You yeah. take it to the next stage. So that, that that's the act, that's kind of an intense activity. But the ideas they come during some other activity. One one good um, way to maybe find ideas is to go to conferences, to, to hear talks. And many times it happened to me that it is not that the subject was directly related to what I need. The speaker was talking about something else. Many times when I visit, for example, the American Physics Society where many disciplines are, are represented, some talks I, I really choose far from my discipline. First of all, to, to study something new, but also sometimes you look at, at the graph and the graph is about some population of something in the desert, right? Or, 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 or something that's not related at all to, to, to my research on atoms and molecules. But you look at the graph and you say to yourself, okay, that's some kind of dynamics that looks similar to something else. So you get an idea from somebody else's research that is not related to your research. And this, this happened to me more than once. It's interesting how it has to be sort of teased out. You have to actively be inactive and indirect about finding those circumstances where yes. that does emerge. But it, it's sort of like trying to fall asleep, where the moment you actively sit there and say, I need to go to bed, I'm stressed, I need to wake up, is the moment you've committed to never falling asleep. And the yeah. moment you let the mind wander is the moment you get what you're looking for. Exactly. It's just yeah, so that's... Uh... Another thing I wanted to talk about, a little changing directions, um, going back to your background. Again, born in Ukraine, you lived there for about nine, ten years, right? Before yes. coming to Israel? I, 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 I came to Israel when I was ten years and a half. Okay, yeah. One thing that I think is interesting about your background, especially academically, is you've been entrenched in some of the, the richest of the scientific traditions culturally. I mean, you have the Soviet Union and the post-Soviet states, you have Israel, which is, of course, a powerhouse of its own, um, Germany at the Max Planck Institute, and then I feel like the Anglo-Saxon version is sort of more omnipresent. You can't avoid that bit. So I find the whole topic of the cultural sort of substrate of, of how, where and how science is being done to be very interesting, because, you know, Israel is a great example, very new country. Um, just an, especially relative to the population, disproportionately contributes to the, the body of knowledge and innovation and so on. And you look at Israel and Israelis and so on, and it's not much of a surprise. And I would argue you can say the same thing about Germans and Russians and so on. So how do you, do you agree or sort of conceptualize this at all? Do you find that you look at the, your Russian colleagues and your Israeli colleagues and the Germans and there's this clear pattern where they have these perspectives that are sort of ubiquitous, that are clearly advantages? Hmm. 
advantages of doing science, where to do science? Not necessarily where, but sort of in the perspective that a particular group of people might embody. I mean, some, sometimes it's as simple as look at Israel. I mean, there's a clear priority in science and technology, sort of it, not, at, not at the superficial level, at a more fundamental level. I mean, to be Israeli, to be Jewish even, is perhaps to put these things on a pedestal. But, but yeah, I mean, I mean at least when, when we discuss Israel here, first of all, here I know, know more, so I can maybe give, give a better answer. Um, generally, in the Jewish tradition, education was something extremely important. Extremely important. Um, now, the, the, the canonical Jewish education is, is within uh, Jewish religion, Torah, Jewish law, uh, uh, Talmud, uh, right? But it so happened, right? When, when Jewish people first, even before coming to Israel, so abroad, mainly, mainly in Europe, but not not only, were allowed to 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 be admitted to universities. Let's not forget, no. it, it became possible. I think by the end of the nineteenth century or mid nineteenth mm -hmm. century, depending on the country. Then this this tradition of education, of being educated, of the fact that being an educated person is something extremely important. This, of course, was the driving force, uh, both in Jewish communities abroad, but also uh, when people uh, moved to Israel, so late 19th, beginning of 20th century. So the, the Hebrew University was established right in, in the, what, 1925, mm -hmm. right? So we'll be celebrating soon um, 100 years of the Hebrew University. Um, at the time when 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 life here was very very difficult, mm -hmm. right? So you would imagine that there are different priorities, right? First of all, maybe you should build yourself a better house, right? Or yeah. be be uh, yeah, be better off. But um, but no, education uh, was always important, and I can say that in my family, definitely, education was extremely. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm not sure I'm in a, in a position to now compare no, different sure. cu uh, cultures, different sure. countries and so on. I, I think I don't know enough, but I think that this basic, uh, this basic vector that is set many times by, by parents, uh, what are what are the prior priorities in life? They is it, this gives a boost. It gives a boost. Mm -hmm. I don't uh, I have to admit I don't remember ever discussing with my parents uh, the question of going to university. It was kind of a given. Yeah. It was, was not, not, not really <laughs> discussed, <laughs> <Of course. laughs> right? Mm -hmm. um, and and if I think about previous generations in our family, so yeah, so. Uh, Already, or, or, already, uh, for my grandparents, uh, the uh, three out of four of them uh, received received a university education, and uh, uh, one of my grandmothers went to what was called their technical, so kind of a technical school, mm -hmm. which was always, uh, also highly rated, and yeah, uh, she was an economist later. Um, but it was something important, and, and if we take into account that, let's say, all my grandparents came from uh, just a poor background or, 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 or families fa families that were, were not wealthy in, in, in any manner, mm -hmm. and then three out of four of them, the great-grandparents were really peasants working on the ground. Mm -hmm. um, the desire for education, the desire to um, to study, this was something something common, I would say, in our family. I just read an article, um, a short article about about uh, some bookstore in in, in Petah Tikva being closed, uh, and 
the the old guy who was running the store, he 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 said that he witnessed this uh, wave of uh, uh, Russian immigration, or we prefer to say the word repatriation to Israel during the 1990s. Um, and he said, not always they had, uh, he, he was selling books, right, and also used books mm -hmm. for, for people that, that have less mm -hmm. uh, resources. Uh, he said, not always that they had that they money for food, but, but the school books they would definitely buy. Mm -hmm. That's something that, that uh, 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 this person who was selling them books, he noticed. Um, so I would, I would yeah, generally emphasize that. Mm -hmm. Education is important. Yeah, I guess once, once the family line gets the ball rolling, as you said, it's just sort of ingrained, and then, yeah, if you live in certain sufficiently uncomfortable conditions, then education is just the clearest path out and it becomes a priority rapidly. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, but I think it's kind of also <clears throat> a matter of decision, right? So uh, if someone is not coming from a background of, of, of going to university, then, well, you can decide it either for yourself or at least push your, your children to that direction. I mean, it's not what 100%. It's sure, it's a generalization, yeah. But, yeah. Uh, and, and on a broadly more historical note, again, that was, I think, the first conversation that we had over coffee was specifically because I had a question about the fact that the namesake of this center, the mm -hmm. Fritz Albert Center for Molecular Dynamics. And I'd like to at least briefly rehash that because I still find it, it's, it's a rich story of science history. So just to outline the long story short, and feel free to correct if I make any mistakes, but again, Fritz Haber was a scientist in the early 20th century, German descent. Um, he's responsible for essentially being able to feed the world at scale via the industrial manufacturing of ammonia and therefore fertilizer, um, but also was integral in early German chemical manufacturing, chlorine gas for World War I, and then Zyklon B, which was used, of course, throughout the gas chambers in Nazi Germany, or many of them at least, and as far as I know, I mean, not know it correctly, uh, Cyclone B was, was some kind of a derivative that Free Summer was already not involved directly ah. in, in a, 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 a developing, it, it, but it was a derivative out of his research. I see, okay. That's, uh, that's, uh, that's I think, the, the status, better to check. Yeah, no, but that is, that is, yeah. a, key, that is a key distinction. Yeah. So, yeah, and then and I think he was very similar to Theodor Herzl and a lot of other Jewish people at the time who were in in modern day Germany. Is they sort of uh, almost fetishized, if you will, German culture, and they believe everybody, including the Jewish people, should say we should aspire to be more German and we should integrate into this culture. And they have a lot of things right and so on. And he Free sort of felt German. yeah, and but he largely, as far as I understand, rejected his Jewish heritage at sort of the beginning. And then as, as history inched closer to 1939, of course, that changed. But I guess the, the thing that captivated my interest in the beginning was, as much as positive things there are to say, it's, a, it's more significant to name a center at the Hebrew University after the man rather than just being able to say, yeah, you know, he's, an, he's a dynamic person of history. So how do you think... What is the conception here, I guess I would say? Like why he's, he's, I guess the, the fact that he's the namesake of the center speaks to how well he's regarded. But for being such a potentially controversial dynamic figure, it's an interesting choice. Yeah, so, uh, well, first of all, maybe it's better to ask, uh, to ask other colleagues here as well at the Fritz Haber Center. So, so the center was established in 1981. Um, Attempting to uh, um, boost the scientific relationships with uh, with Germany, with German scientists uh, in molecular dynamics, or or maybe broadly broadly speaking, theoretical and computational chemistry, and uh, uh, this is something that the center is doing still today. So um, I can. I can say, and and I, I, I hope I hope I, I uh, have now the correct recollection. What was one uh, was once told, uh, so 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 the, the, uh, the head of our uh, center, uh, Roy Bert, 
told me about about Fritz Haber and how he views how he views this issue. Maybe later I can give a small note sure. on a more general perspective yes, of please. naming naming things after people. Um, so Fritz Haber can be viewed as, as in a sense a tragic figure. And not a singular it's kind of not a singular story. So Fritz Haber comes from a family of Jewish descent. Um, he received a general education. At some point, if I know it correctly, he uh, 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 converted to Christianity, no. Prost protest Protestantism, I think. Um, this this was quite common, I, I think, in the late 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, sometimes to 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 uh, to get on with your career, sometimes for marriage, for 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 different reasons. Uh, and Fritz Haber considered himself a German patriot, real German patriot, and uh, he had a military rank in the army in World War One. Uh, he contributed. Substantially to the uh, to the German military power um, uh, during World War One with, with chemical weapons, he was proud about it. He thought that as a German patriot, that's what he should do. Um, but then he uh, discovered as early as 1933. Okay, not 39, mm -hmm. beginning World yeah. War Two. 1933. So, so the, the rise of the of the uh, National Socialist Party in Germany to power, the rise of Hitler to power, he discovered that as the head of a research center with well-known contributions to science internationally and to Germany as a state, being a German patriot and a German officer and a Christian person, all this is not enough because at the end of the day you are a Jew. That's what he discovered. And that's quite a trend. Yes. Um, it was not unique to him. Many people in Germany discovered that although they fought in World War I and they have the medals on their chest and they sacrificed their health and some of them sacrificed, some of their friends, let's say, sacrificed their life. In 1933, it became very clear that the, if you're Jewish, all this doesn't count. Maybe it counted for a very short period at the beginning of the Nazi regime, but that eventually this, this doesn't count. Uh, this is, by the way, the story of uh, uh, my wife's great grandfather, um, who was who was, was a soldier during World War I in, in Germany, but this didn't help him. Um, and they, they escaped to the, to the United States. And, and it is the story of many people. So the, also the, uh, um, the father of our discipline, density functional theory, Walter Cohen, uh, he was uh, an Austrian Jew, and he, he fled uh, as as a teenager uh, to England and then uh, later he was moved uh, to Canada. Um, so it was a story of many people of, of suddenly understanding that, uh, that things are different. Uh, this happened in Nazi Germany to an extent not that extreme but to an extent it also happened in the Soviet Union Many people at the beginning, in at the beginning of the 20th century, uh, Jewish people in the Soviet Union, that they, they said, okay, the, the imperial regime, the Tsarist regime, it comes to an end. Now we are free. Now we are equal to all the others. Many Jews fought uh, 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 soldiers in the Red Army. But then it was, uh, it was made clear to them that, that uh, everyone are equal, but uh, sometimes Jews are, are equal less. And that's very, very painful. That's a very bitter feeling. Uh, 
so in the, in the Soviet uh, uh, history, a critical moment was in 1953, uh, where Stalin and his regime contemplated basically to exterminate Jews or to send them far away to, to Eastern Siberia. And it almost happened, it almost happened, but uh, Stalin died. And they think that they did not dare. So it is, it is kind of uh, contested uh, in, uh, among historians because it's very difficult to discuss an historical event that did not happen. Yeah, sure. But I can tell just one story um, in defense or so, <laughs> of maybe so, some, some comments of people that, that may come uh, regarding this, this story, this piece. My grandfather... Um, before uh, World War II, he, uh, uh, he was born in Czechoslovakia, which became this, this, this part, uh, uh, became then Hungary. Uh, and uh, he lived there and he went through the Holocaust, through the camps. And when he came back in 1945, this, uh, this area joined, or was forced to join, the USSR. And then he became a Soviet citizen. And uh, eight years later, 1953, he was shown by a friend from the secret police a list of all the Jews of this city that just went through this, this, this horror of the Holocaust with their addresses and in which uh, uh, in which uh, how it's called? Wagon? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Train? Uh, tra but so they, the logistics were developed to yeah, that extent. In which wagon they're traveling to the east. From the same, to, from the very same train station from which he already left in 1944 yeah. to Auschwitz, and was lucky enough to come back from the, the, that very same uh, train station. He, they almost left eastwards, but then Stalin died. Lucky, yes. yeah. Uh, uh, so um, I think that, that uh, this history of Fritz Haber on one hand and and. and many other people yes. in, in different countries on so the other hand teaches us something um, the attempt of Jewish people but maybe not only the attempt to join a group or while you make an attempt to join a group you should make sure that this group accepts you as well make sure that this happens Otherwise, you might be surprised. Right. Um, so Fritz Haber was surprised. And then what happens, right, after he basically took his family out of Germany, he resigned from the, being the head of the, uh, uh, of the uh, Kaiser Wilhelm Institute in Berlin, or of its parts. Mm -hmm. He flees Germany, and then he gets... Uh, an invitation by Dr. Chaim Weizmann to go to, to what will become Israel, to uh, mandatory Palestine, uh, British mandate here, to be a he uh, the head of the, uh, of the SIF Institute, which will later become the Weizmann Institute. Um, he doesn't make it, right? He dies en route yeah. right? in Switzerland. So after, now I don't know, I kind of fill in the gaps in, in, in the, the, the historical pieces that I know. Maybe it's a good idea to, to, to dig into it. But uh, after some change happens, so he, he admits that, okay, this Jewish part of his identity is there. It's based, and basically, thanks to this part, he gets the opportunity to, okay, to continue his research somewhere here in the desert. Uh, of of uh, of, of uh, the British mandate Palestine, um, then he, he doesn't accomplish it. So so uh, that's that's a tragic story. Now one another other comment on this is that okay, as you said, the dynamical person. So he he had some great achievements that, that humanity uses to this day, and he also contributed to the military machine of. Uh, of World War One uh, on the German side. Um, 
how to relate to a prominent person with a complex background. Right? We can also find other uh, examples, okay. right? So, Erwin Schrödinger, the father of the Schrödinger equation, uh, a very important scientist, but on the personal note, uh, had affairs with very la young ladies. Today this would be illegal. Mm. I think at the time it may not be illegal. But how do we relate to that? Do, do, do we... Do we... Uh, By the, the values of our time uh, to them or... Yeah. Or of their time. Yeah. Sometimes... Uh, I have to say that the first time I, uh, uh, as a young person, I kind of confronted this question uh, was when uh, I really liked and my, my, my parents really liked uh, a, a, a singer and performer uh, uh, who lived in the Soviet Union. His name was Vladimir Pesotsky. He was very well known. Uh, very good songs, some of them a bit oppositional to the regime as much as it was possible, uh, but he died in 1980 when he was a drug addict. So you raise your kids, right? How do you, it, it, you have these songs at home, right? So how, how do you explain this? And uh, this exercise of sometimes, maybe not always it's possible, but sometimes to disconnect, let's say, the science from the science or even the art from the artist, right? Is something that, that is, is, is worth pursuing. Sometimes you may say, okay, it cannot be disconnected. Uh, Lines can be crossed. Yeah, but but, but uh, I think that at least in natural sciences, many times we can disconnect the science from the scientist. Because we can, we can go back and we can derive the equations ourselves. We can say, okay, Schrodinger derived it first. But now we re-derive it, we, uh, uh, with our mind, with our logic, we, we, we reconstruct all this and, uh, uh, and the, equations, the equations hold. That's, that's the important thing. Naming the equations after Schrodinger or anyone else, that's, that's a different question. So in natural sciences it's possible. In art, I don't know, maybe it's much less possible. One last thing on, the, on that point it's also occurred to me, uh, happened to me when, when, I was, when I was a kid, is this broader question of whether at all to name things mm. after persons. So, you have a research center, you have a, 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 some a, a company, you have some invention, you have, you have a computer program, something you, you do, okay? Some product or, 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 or enterprise or whatever. And you choose to name it after a person. Maybe not. Because later, I mean, I mean the product yeah. is good, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but then it, if it is related to a person that later we discover that, okay, uh, there was some questionable behavior, or, or something in the in the standards of that time was okay, but in the standards of our time is is, is much less so. You ruin the product, right? You had a very very good computer program, okay? The computer programs I write, I I never name them after after people. I name them after uh, uh, flowers yes, or, sure. or or plants or or, or, or or something something to that effect, and and. Uh, I mentioned that as a kid I saw it because one day in 1991, just when the Soviet Union yeah. mean, just did dissembled and it was independent Ukraine, so Western Ukraine was, was fast on that and immediately many street names were just crossed out and in addition to the previous name you got another plaque with a new name. So the old heroes are thrown, mm -hmm. thrown to the garbage of history. Many of them were criminals, were, were, yeah. and some of them maybe not. Now, the previous ones, we can also question how yeah. good they were. That's, 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 but this, uh, the streets 
that their names were not changed, were streets that were named after, I don't know, uh, uh, plants, animals, uh, uh, something, yeah. something that, that is not people. So this could be a way out, right? <laughs> sure. uh, if you establish something new, or you have a new, uh, a new product, or, or, or you write a piece of software, uh, give it the name of a flaw. <laughs> the flip side of that, though, the thing that comes to mind immediately is, one thing is it's sort of the, it's our, it, there's something that I feel is in sync with the human condition about kind of preserving, because if, if we, we rely on history being known and understood purely through history books and so on, I worry that we're, the past will effectively, be, if it's not omnipresent through all of these naming schemes, I feel, there's just, I, yeah, I would have to think about it more deeply, but I, there's something that just um, automatically emergent that I don't like. I like the idea of feeling this connection through history, through having all of these things named. You're right, you get to avoid the headache in the first place, which is a tremendous advantage. Yeah. But I want to live in a world where we can be mature enough and give, first of all, the good people who did the incredible work the, the credit that they deserve and have them maintain this place in history. And also I think it's just functionally a, a productive way to keep history in the front of people's minds. Because if everything is named after a flower and a, and a tree and so on, <laughs> then I feel like only the historians will have a good sense of the past. But you're right. I mean, it is, it's, a, it's a very... And that's... The U.S. has been going through this for a long time now and probably will to the future, especially with everything from the Civil War, from everything from slavery and so on. And it is... I mean, Robert E. Lee, the general of the South, is one of the... the, the best American examples of this because, you know, he led the South and led the charge in that regard, but he was also sort of famous for as soon as, as, soon as the South lost the war, being one of the first to, to come into church and push back against white Americans who were still trying to say, you know, blacks go to the back and say, no, we lost. So I think in general, people, the solution might be found in just developing an appreciation in people to understand that n very few people are so static. There is a dynamism in everybody to the extent that very, I would argue very few cross that line. You know, there should probably never be a Hitler Boulevard or something to that extent. There are those figures who are just atrocious beyond the point of return. But probably most people, it's a name at the end of the day, you know. But it is an interesting... Oh, that's, that's true. Um, yeah, I tend to agree. So first of all, it's, it's more difficult to um, accept the fact that many people, maybe all people, right, are complex yeah. people. Yeah. They have their strong sides and they have their weak sides. We would like to... Uh, Idealize. Uh, yeah, this, this is something we shouldn't, yeah, right? Agreed. We would like to somehow associate ourselves yes. to, the, to their achievements, to their strong sides, to, uh, yeah, to some, something good they, they did for, for humanity, or for this planet. Uh, but there are also the other side own stall. So yeah. that's something to take into account. I, I think though that, that from time to time, you know, if we live in a certain city and, and, and there are streets that are named after after certain figures, once in a while those people who live there may have the right to yeah, you know to sorry. reconsider it and, and to, to renew some of the some of the names. But but still we have to take into account that also these new figures they are not <laughs> They are not yeah, ideal, they are not all, well. all pure, right? Yeah. Uh, so that's, that's something to, to take into account. Yeah. So let me quickly check the time. I'll ask you one more thing, if that's all right. Yeah. Um, just lingering on this topic. This, by the way, this is why I didn't come with the outline, is I haven't even gotten to anything electron dynamics or anything of the sort. But um, no, you know, just going on your website and, again, having a common interest in the history of science and so on, I, looking at the quotes you have, on your group page is interesting. A, a few things to note. One is that I saw, interestingly, Frank Lloyd Wright was one of the people that you quote. And just as an aside, the, if I were to pull out of my house at home in Arizona, the street is Frank Lloyd Wright, and directly across the street is one of his more famous museums. Um, so it's always interesting, because I feel like he's not such a big name internationally, necessarily. So it was cool to see yeah. him <laughs> represented yeah. there. But beyond learning the mistakes of the past, do you, what is your interest in the history of science? Because there's also just something sort of intrinsically just fun, you know? There's, there's a more superficial appeal that is less, less practical. Yeah, so first of all, it's fun. 
Yeah. So, so it's fun. Uh, so regarding the history of science, uh, on my side, I, I've read several biographies of, of scientists. That's, mm-hmm. that's my source of, of, of uh, uh, in addition to, to university courses. Uh, it's, a, it's very interesting to, to read a biography of, of a scientist. First of all, sometimes you are encouraged, so you see that people that start from very difficult conditions, personal or financial, or situations of discrimination, for example, uh, Marie Curie, right? As a female, uh, at the end of the 19th, beginning of 20th century, this was a a very tough uh, way. as a student, she was in extremely difficult conditions. Didn't maybe get enough support. Maybe if she got more resources, more support, she, she could flourish more. But uh, she was very determined, mm-hmm. right? She was very determined to do something, to understand something, to to push this full. So this is something that is, is encouraging. And it happens in many stories. So. Uh, I think that, that I started this uh, in courses with your class, but now I continue it in, in various courses, that a student can get uh, one bonus point to, to his grade, just giving us a short summary about one of the scientists that we mentioned in class. Just as we go, yeah. there are names of, 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 of laws or right equations or, or methods or whatever, with names of scientists, about some of them we know more, about some of them we know less, and uh, there is an opportunity for a student to present something. Um, and when students get exposed to this and they, they learn about various scientists and they emphasize it to them, look, this person actually, his destiny was to be someone else. Yeah. His family planned for him a different career, but he had this idea. And he went at the end to Oxford or to Cambridge or to University of Heidelberg. Or, mm-hmm. right? Because there was some internal driving force he could not handle. This driving force was, was taking him forward. So that's something, something uh, to take. Uh, sometimes, yeah, there are mistakes of the past. So, so, for example, the husband of Marie Curie, Pierre Curie, yeah. he died not of uh, radioactivity. It was a car accident. He crossed the street and he was thinking about something and, 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 the, and the ferry hit him. Lorry, uh, uh, Lorry hit him. Mm-hmm. So, uh, if you have this, they said, yeah. Get out of the road. Be, no, 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 be on the pedestrian lane. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so, also this type of story. So mm-hmm. sometimes, I mean, really, sometimes life, the life of a scientist can just stop in the middle of everything mm-hmm. because of some circumstances, right? Evariste Galois, uh, well-known, uh, now well-known mathematician, he died at the, at, at the age of 21 yeah. uh, 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 at a duel. Yeah. Okay. Maybe he lived. Imagine. Yeah. Uh, uh, he, could, he could contribute uh, much more. So... Uh, but I think it's fun. It's interesting. It's encouraging, especially for young people, to to get exposed to the history of science, either in the in form of uh, uh, a biography or a sign of a scientist or other source. But uh, yeah, I would yeah. I would recommend it. Well, again, thank you so much. We appreciate taking the time.